throughout the, nearly seven years of Future Transform, we've been looking hard at the future of higher education. And in order to do so, we try to look equally hard at research and data about the present and about the recent past. This gives us a better insight into the future. Now, one of the great enterprises for doing that research is the National Student Clearinghouse, which does a tremendous job of surveying the current data about colleges and universities. Our two guests have just published a report which looks at one particular slice of all that data. And if you look at the bottom left of our screen, you'll see a kind of mustard colored button that has a link to it. What they've done is look carefully at the experience of first year college and university students, trying to understand what happens to them on the route to potential academic success. The report is fascinating, clear, backed up by data, and I'm really looking forward to hearing more about how this report was created and what they've learned. And I'd love to hear your thoughts. So first, let me welcome to the stage uh, Afet Dundar, who is one of the lead researchers. Let's see if we can bring her up. Good afternoon. Hi. Hello. Good to see you, Dr. Dundar. Good to see you again. Good to see you. I'm glad you made it. I'm glad you made it. Where are you today? Where have we found you? In Washington, D.C. Ah, so it is nice and cool and comfortable outside? No, that's a total lie. It's a swamp. Well, we, we have a tradition on the, on the program of asking people to introduce themselves by describing what they're going to be working on for the next year. And I would have to, I, I, I imagine you have a lot on your plate. What kind of projects are you working on and, and what ideas, what topics are top of your mind? Absolutely. Um, thank you so much for arranging this and thank you for everyone uh, for being here. We are very excited to be here to share some of the findings from our report. Um, looking to the future, I wanted to say a few things. You know, since the release of this report, we have had a lot of positive feedback, a lot of questions also. Um, uh, whether we know how these metrics will look for uh, for the students who uh, who started in the pandemic years. So that's going to be next for us. Uh, we are keeping an eye on the data and as institutions are submitting new data, as soon as we feel like we can do that, we will uh, produce these metrics. We'll continue this research for, for students who started in 2021 and 20, uh, 2022. Um, and okay. in addition, uh, also the Crane House as an organization that holds a lot of data uh, the organization is interested in establishing and driving forward the principles for equitable data use and mm -hmm. uh, for, uh, for driving forward the principles for inclusive, unbiased, um, uh, unbiased approach to data collection and analytics. And I'm leading that work, uh, which means really to look uh, looking at the data and looking at the whether what kind of biases there might be in the historical data, analyzing data, how we are using it so that it, we would not uh, what we are producing wouldn't perpetuate inequities, but rather uh, would would contribute to equity. So that um, uh, that is a plan for the near future. Wow, that's a lot of great work. I, I think everyone will want to see what you find out about the COVID, the, the first COVID class experience. And of course, doing the great just work of, of making sure data is not you know, repeating and reproducing inequities. Fantastic. Well, um, Dr. Dundar, let me put you here for a second and let me add to our stage, your wonderful colleague, and let me bring him up on stage as well. Um, let's see if I can just do this. Aha, uh -huh, here we go. And welcome, Benjamin England. Good to see you, sir. Thanks, Brian. Thank you for having me. Well, welcome. I'm really glad you could make it. Oh, well, you heard how we how we ask these questions. You've had time to prepare your answer. What does the next year lie ahead for you? Um, so I would say one of the great things about my upcoming year and what I'm looking forward to is actually working with Afet on a lot of the work that she also just outlined. Um, what I come back uh, with experience in is a lot more of practitioner working with higher education um, folks as well as within higher education. Um, so hopefully I can bring that that scope and that lens to a lot of the work that Afet has talked about and work in conjunction with her. I also hope to really help our users um, that are on the ground, so to speak, using PDP data um, to advance student success in an equitable manner um, with some of the principles that I'm working with uh, AFET to guide and um, help the NSC actually create uh, across the organization. Excellent. Excellent. 
uh, again, important stuff to work on. And I forgot to ask you, where are you today geographically? Are you also in D.C.? I am in, actually, I am in Albuquerque, New Mexico. Um, so yeah. we are quite warm here, but less humid at least. Uh, so yeah. that's the one win. It's a dry heat. Um, yes. well, and uh, what, what is it noon or 11 there? Uh, it is 12, 13 here. So, yeah, we are two hours behind the East Coast here. Well, good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon. Thank you. Um, well, uh, friends, I, I want to put a couple of questions to our guests, um, but then um, I'd love to hear what you are interested in and what you'd like to see. Uh, so to begin with, uh, I'd like to ask, your report has so much information, um, but I was wondering if you could tell us all a bit about how you assembled this, specifically what kind of data set you had, and also what, uh, what do you mean by credit completion ratio, and what do you mean by credit accumulation ratio? I think that's the big innovation to be on the that first year experience. Sure. The, the data we are using for this report come from a service of the clearinghouse called Post-Secondary Data Partnership. Um, mm -hmm. I'll call it PDP the rest of the time. So mm -hmm. PDP started in 2017 with only 70 institutions. Uh, with a commitment to uh, to student success and commitment to producing outcomes, uh, really commitment to uh, contributing to equitable outcomes for all students. We mm. are collecting uh, course credit grade information within PDP. And for this, uh, so it started with 70 institutions. Currently, we have about 500 institutions in PDP. For this particular report, we are using students who started in 2019-2020, mm. uh, the year 1920. And uh, we were able to use data from 342 institutions. These are mm. uh, four-year public and private institutions, as well mm -hmm. as two-year public institutions. We have a little over 900,000 students in the sample. Um, and we have two groups of students. These are all first-year students, first-time students in that school. But about 600,000 of the students are first-time ever students. And the uh, one third of the sample are students who, who were first time in that school where they started, but they had enrollment in a different school. So we call them transfer. first time transfer in students yeah. in the sample. Right. Um, and uh, a few other things about the metrics, what we are using, uh, we call them early momentum metrics, credit accumulation rate and credit completion ratio, or the, um, and as a name we use is leading indicators. And the reason why they are leading indicators, uh, these are the metrics that institutions can look at while the students are enrolled, as opposed to some of the traditional measures such as completion rate, where uh, when we look at the data of a particular cohort, students who didn't finish, they are they are gone already. So uh, good for uh, policy making, but not so much for practitioners to help uh, the students while they are enrolled. And the um, uh, credit accumulation rate and credit completion ratio are really for the practitioners to look at the data to help the students uh, see which students uh, who needs uh, support and really support their work, support their um, a, a, as they are enrolled. Credit accumulation rate, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about when we come to the findings. It is about measuring uh, whether students, what percentage of the students reach certain thresholds. These are uh, part-time enrollment thresholds, such as uh, earned uh, 12 credits or 15 credits, or full-time enrollment thresholds, such as uh, whether students earned uh, 24 credits or 30 credits within their first year. And we are looking at the uh, full first year. Uh, credit completion ratio is, is a percentage of the student, a uh, percentage of the credits earned out of all credits attempted by the students. So if they're trying for an undergraduate degree, say roughly 120 credits? Yes, yes. And the report looks at the first year, yes. I see, I see. Okay, well, th well thank you. That's, that's a tremendous amount of data. I mean, nearly a million students, um, and you've got a nice variety of institutions, and the total number is something like you know, about seven percent of the of the whole uh, of the U.S., which is which is excellent. A uh, quick clarifying question came from Tom Hames. He asks, do transfers include dual credit students? So this uh, the cohort actually is defined by the institutions. 
Um, yeah. Yeah. We, we do have indicator was that they had dual enrollment or summer enrollment for that student yeah. in that uh, in that institution. So they, uh, that's how it comes from the institution. Benjamin, do you want to add anything to that? Yeah, so for the most part, I, I believe it, uh, the institutions do adhere to the formal sense of a transfer student and not code a previously dual enrolled student as a transfer student. Um, but it is the institution coding them as a transfer student. Very good. So some of them are dual. Um, well, thank, thanks for the quick answer. And, and Tom, thanks for the good question. Um, and again, if, thank you for the for the detailed analysis. I mean, this is a really good way, I think, to, to try and parse what's happening to these uh, large number of students as they move through this crucial year. Um, but now, given all that, and I, I, friends, if you have any other research methodology questions or data questions, please start lining them up because these people can answer them. But I'm wondering about your findings. I mean, you were slicing and dicing um, these students um, through uh, several different lenses, including transfer status, but also including gender and also including race. And you found really divergent experiences. Um, can you can you say a few words about these findings? And what were some of the strongest differences you found, for example? Yes, absolutely. I can say more than a few words. <laughs> um, we have a lot of data points in the report. We really hope that they are actionable. Um, I'll, I'll mention just a few of them to convey perhaps the big picture, what is going on, on these two metrics. And I'll start with uh, credit completion ratio. Again, wow. this is the... Um, this is the percentage of credits earned out of all students attempted in their first year. And on average, uh, students earn 76% of their students in this sample. And when we look separately at transfer in students, it's a little higher, 79%. And when we look at first time ever in college students, um, it was 74% for this particular cohort. Uh, when we looked at separately for, um, to, uh, Male students and female students, uh, women had slightly higher credit completion ratio at 78% and men had uh, 73%. So, and then we looked at the, uh, and, uh, at this re ratio by, by race ethnicity. And we do see variation in there. Uh, we see black students and American Indian or Alaska Native students had, uh, they earned just about two thirds of the credits they attempt, attempted. Mm -hmm. It was 67% and 68% for those students. For Hispanic students and Native Hawaiian or other um, the Pacific Islander students, the rate uh, was at uh, 74 percent and 73 percent and i know these are a lot of percentages and numbers and for white and asian students credit uh, completion ratio was about 80 percent and 84 percent wow yes and then, of course uh, we also looked at what we call intersectional experiences right we looked at um by race ethnicity for uh, female students only and for male students only um uh, I will not go through all those percentages, but I would say that for for uh, nearly every racial ethnic group, uh, women did have a slightly higher credit completion ratio than men. Um, but the pattern uh, pattern stayed consistent. What we saw for overall numbers. Oh, that's fascinating. So we have on the one hand women edging out men slightly, uh, but significantly, um, and then you have a, a racial spread which seems to map on to a lot of American uh, academic performance. Um, what did you, oh gosh, uh, friends, I, I don't want to hog the mic here. Um, I'm sure you all have tons of questions uh, and you just got a really compressed executive summary of some of the major findings. Um, this is the platform for your questions and comments. And uh, we already have Brian, one. If, if you Please. don't mind, I'll say just a uh, few more things about credit accumulation rate and then we'll open up for, for the questions. Um, so uh, credit accumulation rate, uh, this is the threshold. I mentioned earlier that we looked at what percentage of students uh, reached different thresholds. Did they earn at least 12 credits, 15 mm. credits, mm. 24 credits, and or 30 credits uh, within their first full year? And the overall numbers, uh, about 63% of the students uh, earned uh, 12 credits at least 12 credits when we looked at 15 credits it was just a little over half of the students 54 percent um 
only one third of the students, these first year uh, students, earned um, 24 credits in their first year. And um, 18%, just 18% earns 30 credits in their first year. This is this is rich stuff. And thank you. Thank you. Hud. I mean, so friends, this is one of the reasons why we have um, our experts doing this. Um, and we have questions. Oh, and here's one right now. And this is from a great friend of our program and uh, a host, uh, or sorry, a guest at one time. So it is fantastic work, the splendid Christine Wolf Eisenberg. And she asks this. How have you started analyzing 2020, 2021 data yet? I'm concerned, but not surprised to see the disruption of the 1920 academic year reflecting credit accumulation. I'm eager to see how the gap trends from here. Yes, absolutely. I think the cohort we used uh, probably does have some impact from the pandemic, but it is yeah. where also students who started in fall 2019, uh, their first year, uh, would finish uh, in 2020, just a uh, couple of uh, months after uh, after pandemic hit, maybe a few months after pandemic. But then there is spring starters, spring 2020 starters. Uh, yes, absolutely. Uh -huh. We we also look forward to seeing um, how this trend will continue. In, in what ways? Well, good, good question. Uh, and and a good answer, um, given where you all stand in your research. Uh, if you're new to the forum, by the way, that's an example of one of those. Um, question mark Q&A box questions. Um, and here's another one from uh, our friend Ron Friedman. And let me just bring this up so everyone can see it. Uh, did you investigate CCR and CR rates with regard to students' employments, i.e. if they're holding a full or a part-time job? I can certainly address that one, Afet, if you'd like me to. Um, so, you know, I, I think you actually had a great uh, term, Brian, when you said slicing and dicing the data. TDP certainly allows for a lot of that, including intersectional approaches to data analysis. One of the things that we did not capture as of right yet is employment status within the PDP data ecosystem. Uh -huh. um, that is one thing that we actually have realized and more, most recently about, I think two months ago, as we all know, time flies. Uh, about two months ago, we actually did add that. We did add that to the files to be able to actually use that or uh, gather that data alongside other information about students. So that would be certainly something we can consider for any future reports once we start getting that data from our institutions and data providers. Good question. Uh, and thank you, um, Andrew, for that answer. Um, uh, one, A couple of thoughts are coming up right now in the chat, um, and we're, we're going to circle back to a few of them. Uh, I do want to share one note from Julie DeVoe, uh, who says, at our institution, we're seeing a lower credit completion rate this past year because of high rates of withdrawals and incompletes as we return to in-person learning. Uh, so I just wanted to share that. And if, if either of you, Ben, or if, if you want to if you want to comment on that or not, um, I, I think, yes, yeah, certainly during the semester, like Afet talked about the spring semester, um, there were quite a few policies that were put in place that were quite flexible around students um, because of what was occurring um, and potentially understanding what occurred then and then also what may have occurred past then um, in regards to a return to in-person learning um, as a result potentially of that. So that's certainly something to consider in, in any report that we do that really does focus on the COVID impact of CAR and CCR or any other metrics in PDP. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we have uh, a question that came in via Twitter, um, and uh, I want to make sure I understand the question correctly. Um, but uh, we're looking at Higher Ed Dive's report on your report. Uh, and Higher Ed Dive points out that uh, students are, based on these numbers, they're not likely to graduate in four years. In fact, they're not likely to graduate in five, just based on the credit achievement uh, that they're getting right now. Um, can, can you speak to a bit about that and maybe, maybe forecast a little bit or uh, just comment on how it works? Absolutely. Yes, I think even before this report, we had numbers that we were seeing students didn't graduate, not all of them, right? But maybe half in four years or even five years. And that's why increasingly most reports, most research focuses on six year uh, completion or eight year completion. So we had, uh, we knew that that was happening. The good thing about this report shows that um, 
perhaps it starts very early in the first year. We can see where it's going. And that's where support can start in the first year, right? That's the, um, as they are enrolled. Again, completion rates, um, they haven't budged for a very long time. We look at it year after year, um, but we're not able with those rates to help the students because the students are gone already in the cohort. But this shows perhaps they are starting very slowly. I think one of the articles was saying that the title was like that. And, uh, and that's why this report shows where it starts. And that's why these metrics are for practitioners to step in. Uh, uh, good, good. The crucial first year, yes. um, a real chance to intervene. And we have to do it now, uh, given, given what you're saying. Um, along a similar line, uh, we have a question from Amanda Knight, uh, which is more of a solution question. Where do you find the greatest disparity with the room for improvement among a population in the report? So I want to say a couple of things on that. You know, I mentioned earlier that um, women had higher rate than men, but uh -huh. I think uh, we would like our institutions uh, go even further. Maybe there are subpopulations among women, uh, female students that actually have the lower. We don't have that data right now. Maybe there are student parents, right? Student parents are more likely to be women. So there might be even disparities that we are not seeing in this report, but it may exist. And hopefully institutions are looking at those things further. Uh, what we see the disparity is by race ethnicity. And I think there is a lot can be done. Again, these practitioners can really use this data, looking at the course level data. If these are there courses that are that most students are not completing, especially if there are courses that a certain subpopulation of students are not completing, what is going on there? So they can actually analyze that and again step in in the first year while those students are still enrolled. Good, good question, by the way. Really good question. Uh, and we're going to be thinking about this, Amanda, uh, I think for the rest of the hour. In fact, most of us for the next few years. Um, and thank you, Afet. Um, we have a, a question from uh, Hen Ying Fong, um, who, uh, well, I'm going to give this a little more time to see because it's a, it's a rich one. Is the composition of race ethnicity in first year students similar to the composition in the US population? Or is there any race ethnicity that has higher or lower attendance rate overall? Did you want to, yeah, I can certainly answer that. Um, I believe there are some points in the report where we actually do call out ends, but we did focus more on percentages as, as a part of that. Um, and yes, we do know that there are disparities in race, ethnicity, and just those who may enter into post-secondary education. That certainly is something that we are aware of. That was not the focus of the report. Um, it was really looking at, at those students who actually are within their first year, do we see with those disparities, not necessarily looking at those disparities that exist between uh, between groups that maybe are enrolling in post-secondary education. Um, I think that's a, 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 a really important point and not something we shouldn't focus on, but it was just not the focus of this report. Thanks. That makes sense. That makes sense. Uh, and and Yang, thank you for the really good question. Uh, we have uh, another question. Again, people are really all over this, um, which is great. It's what you want. Uh, yes. Our good friend and, uh, and writer, supporter, and uh, one-time guest, uh, Tom Hames, has one of his classic questions. Are there any controls for age? And what about semester start, summer versus fall versus spring? And what about ratios of support staff versus students at institutions? That's a lot to think about. <laughs> I actually want to answer maybe to the very last question, and maybe Benjamin, you can Ben, you can talk a little bit about the uh, outcomes by age. Uh, this, in terms of support staff and um, versus students at institution, we uh, we're not looking at that in this data, but it is a great question because. Uh, that's what I would call system conditions, right? And that's something we should pay attention. We should have data whenever it's possible. Maybe institutions would have that data and hopefully one day we will have that data because it's not just what is going on, what students are doing. It's uh, it's again, what is going on at the institution in terms of the support staff instead of the advisors. Right. So that is important point. That's uh, There are many other things uh, 
that again, I would call system conditions that hopefully we'll have data one day to look at those, how that impacts student outcomes. But in this particular um, report, we don't have it. Okay. I see. This is always a problem when you publish good research is that people keep asking you to do more of it. Uh, that's that's, a, that's always, always a good sign. Um, yeah, and I can certainly address the age question that I believe was being brought up. Um, so one of the things that we did notice, and, and it's I think it's really great to actually look at, is you can look at our age grouping. So we do 20 and younger, uh, older than 20 to 24, and then older than 24 uh, as points of comparison. Um, and if you actually look at kind of the aggregate level of all first time first year, um, you uh -huh. see pretty consistent CCR rates. But then again, with the power of PDP, we're actually able to potentially cross that with another variable. You actually see that at, at kind of the cross level about 76%. But then if you look at first time in college and parse that by those three age groups, you actually see some uh, vast differences. Um, so although 20 and younger are at a, still at about 76% when they're first time in college, those are, are between 20 to 24 when they're first time in college, drop from about 76% to about 67%. Uh -huh. Those older than 24, again, at the, the aggregate level, they're at about 76%. But then if you only look at first time in college, they're dropping to about 70%. Um, so you do see somewhere between kind of six to about 8% drop, just simply if you look at that one, that subgroup of first time in college, instead of just looking at all first time in their first year. Um, so really one of those great parts that we're talking about in this report is looking at those um, variables in combination to make sure that what you're seeing at the aggregate level isn't masked when you actually look at things in combination. And that's really just focusing on CCR. Similar pattern that we see for car rates as well, that typically um, those in the 20 to 24 range and older than 24 also show a decline in car rates. And you can also look at that across part-time and full-time students. Um, so yes, we definitely did examine age. I believe there was also a second question. And by the time I finished answering the first, I have forgotten <laughs> the second. Um, so I don't know if it can pop back up. I tried to jot it down, but I'm not that fast. What, what, about, what about semester start? Uh, the report you know, really did. Yeah, the report really did limit itself to focusing on fall starters. Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, sorry, am I, is my memory going wrong because of the first question I had to answer and use up all my brain power? Uh, no, no, no. We, we have all, all students, yes. Right, it, right. Uh, we did not look separately right. at the outcomes uh, by the term start. Um, but all of them, uh, whether they started in fall, summer, uh, they, uh, and spring, they are all there. So 1920 means fall 19 starters, spring 2020 starts. So it, it's full year starts, yes. Okay, thank you. And that, those are great clarifying questions, Tom. And, and thank you both for, for, uh, for showing us how this, how this fits into uh, what we've accomplished. Um, we have uh, another great question from Lynn Sabolski. Hello, Lynn. Good to see you here. Uh, Lynn asks, can you share a few examples of what have been your personal, whoa, oh my God, standout moments when reviewing the new reports? I'm curious about your personal revelations here. Um, I can say one thing that uh, what we saw transfer students, credit completion ratio being higher than yeah. first time ever in college, at least for this particular cohort. That's what we saw here. That's the um, uh, that was my moment. We were like, oh, we we perhaps we didn't expect it. That would be one thing for me. So that's so you were expecting much lower for tra transfer students. Similar or lower? Yes. Yeah, yeah. So this this is actually this is a good thing that uh, transfer students. It's like they've learned college. Right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. How are you, Ben? Yeah, I, I certainly think that it was not only great to see that the credits that students are attempting on average, you do have uh, students getting um, two thirds or above that, you know, that's pretty solid. But then what really um, shocked me, scared me, worried me, um, all of those words is when you see subgroups that are potentially closer to 50 or 55 percent, meaning um, of potentially the credits they attempt, they are only getting somewhere around half. Um, it was certainly something I think we thought might uh, come out in the data. It's not something we wanted uh, by any means, uh, but we definitely thought that might occur in the data. And unfortunately it did happen for some groups uh, of students. We really do see 
close to about 50%, which is, is quite worrisome. And that's mostly black and Native American men, right? Right, and typically, yeah, if you also look at full-time versus part-time, and so if you parse that or cross that, um, you see that. So for example, um, I believe if you look at uh, black or African first-time and college part-time students, those that's one group that's also at about 50 to 55%, 55%, uh, sorry, um, CCR rates. Okay, okay. Well, the, I mean, those are, first of all, Lynn, that's a great question that everyone should emulate whenever we have a really impressive data-rich and a powerful study like this, but also um, those are those are great responses. Thank you both, uh, Fed and Ben. Um, our uh, wonderful supporter, uh, our great friend in um, uh, Connecticut, Roxana Riskin, uh, asks: Have any of you data on first-year students with disabilities completion or are considered? So I, I can probably handle that, Fed, if you'd like me to. So this actually falls under the same category as the earlier question about employment status. Um, the PDP data ecosystem is rather rich, but that is one thing we just recently added as a, a metric that we're trying to capture from our, our institutions to be able to cross that with some of these other um, variables. Yeah, that makes sense. Good question. And that's a question. We'll probably see more and more uh, people um, working on that. Um, thank you, Roxanne. And we hope you're well, Roxanne. Uh, we have another question from Henying, uh, which is uh, about majors. Any difference in percent of progress by major or course of study in general? I think Ben may be um, able to address that. I'll just briefly say that we do have results by major. We didn't so much see the differences by major, uh, but we saw across two-year, four-year institutions. That's it that's more differences we saw. Really? Can, can you say a bit more about that? I, I can certainly uh, pick up on the institution type. Um, yeah, certainly the major, um, we didn't get down to kind of the level of a two digit CIP code or something like that at, to uh, Fed's mm -hmm. point. There is some analysis uh, at very high level major categories within the report. Um, but we all we do did see um, some shifts per institution type. Um, if you look at uh, some of the analysis for both CCR and CAR, um, you do see changes in both of those rates per institution type. So um, we see something like for a private four year, something about 86% for CCR, um, but then when at public four years, closer to about 81%, and then at public two years, mm -hmm. closer to about 70%. Um, so a gap of about 16%, potentially, depending on which institution type you're looking at as points of comparison. Um, mm -hmm. So you do or see that. Especially, especially between a private four-year and a public two-year. Correct. Yeah. Oh, wow. That's that's another, I would say, Lynn, that's another whoa um, moment right there, uh, at least for me. Uh, and we also have another question from uh, Rachel Rushmorlow. Hello, Rachel. And she asks, did findings look at differences in course delivery method as online versus in-person or hybrid? So that's something uh, we have it in our future plans. We mentioned it at the very uh, end of the report. That would be um, that's also really great a great data element that we have in PDP. But we have not looked at it for this particular in this particular report. Uh, and it's 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 going to matter a great deal, especially when we look at the next year. Right. right. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, in the chat, uh, Christine Wolf Eisenberg responds to my note by saying, I'd argue that community colleges are leading the way in understanding and learning about the needs and talents of today's students. I agree. They're tremendous, tremendous work. Um, uh, thank you, Christine. Um, so, friends, if you have more questions and more comments, again, just use the, uh, the you know, hit the Q&A button. Uh, or if you want to join us on stage, you can tell that a Fed and Ben and even me are all very nice. Um, so we're, we're welcome to join us on stage if you'd like. We also have a running debate going um, about a couple of data questions. So I'll, George and Christine, everybody involved in that, if, if you want to shape that into a question, let me know and or join us on stage and, and, and we can raise that up. Um, One thing, I, um, sorry, Brian, I used to want to jump in about kind of the, the 
the Please. two year um, idea. And I think one thing we didn't get to maybe throw out at the beginning that my FET, myself and Effet did talk about is really Ooh. this data is very much intentional in looking at the entirety of post secondary education and not thinking right. at that one level of post secondary education is the cause necessarily that you think more in kind of an ecological model or hierarchy model that all of these things combine, right? So it's not necessarily just the student that we need to be focusing on. It may be the student at that institution within that state um, that we need to think about. And really that's what the report is meant to really um, advocate for is asking the why and why does it exist uh, why do we see these numbers as potentially all these policies, these procedures, these things that are going on that may actually cause this? Um, so definitely not. My point was certainly not to say, you know, two-year institutions are are not doing a good job. That's certainly not what we were saying. We were just saying this is what we're seeing in the numbers and, and right. for practitioners, for researchers to try to figure out why. Um, I've had, I don't know if you had anything else you wanted to amend or clarify in that point. Absolutely. No, great points. I would say this would be uh, also a good reason for cities, counties, and states to actually support community colleges to a legitimate higher level. But that that's thats me opining. I'm sorry, not from your study. Um, we had a, a follow-up question, um, again, from uh, Ayla Moore. Uh, and Ayla asks, I understand there wasn't identification based on declared majors. I wonder if undecided students identified also was faculty status identified, adjuncts versus tenure track or tenured? <laughs> I, let me, I'll answer the second question then, Afet. Um, so what I think is great is that we're understanding that where the uh, post-secondary data partnership needs to go is things that we are actually currently in the process of doing. Um, understanding the employment status of the instructor, whether what rank they are, as well as whether they are full-time or adjunct, is again, another thing that we just recently added to the PDP data submission. And it's great to hear that that actually is gonna be useful for our institutions, researchers, practitioners, um, based on all these questions. Um, so it's great that we've, we've recently added that and we hopefully will be getting that data in. Um, from our, our providers shortly. Well, once again, you're being punished by success. Um, <laughs> yes. with more, with more and more work. Uh, good question. Uh, and, and of course, that it's a huge, huge internal and external policy questions uh, around that. We have, um, let me bring on stage uh, Julie DeVoe. If I haven't mispronounced your name too Hi. badly, Julie, please correct me if I have. Hello. Hi, that's me. That's correct. Thank you. Sorry, I tried to type my question. It was too long, so um, I don't oh, mean welcome. to be too wordy, but um, I was really interested in this study because I spent the morning working with a student who is now, you know, in academic probation because of course completion rate. And it came out of like at, coming out of COVID, our data, I can imagine my institution's data in this PDP will be blown to pieces because of um, generous incompletes, generous pass fails. You could have less credits and still be considered a full-time student. Like the paradigm of which we were working under for what it meant to complete courses on time was, t was really shifted in 2020. That bled until last year and it's bleeding until now because if somebody got behind, there, it's maybe just now that they're getting flagged for not being on progress like towards graduation. So I can imagine you go to run this for 2020, 2021, you're going to see some really different things because the underpinning of like being a full-time student, I think in a lot of institutions changed. So I'm curious about like, you talked about a lot of factors that you're going to be considering the next go around, but there's a massive COVID factor. I'm curious about how you're going to tackle that because I feel like it's going to show up in really weird ways. Thank you, Julie. Good question. Yeah. And Afat, what do you think? Oh, absolutely. And we are going to probably discuss the results in that context. And in PDP, we have an advisory group from uh, rep with representatives from different types of institutions. We'll definitely consult them too. And uh, please send us your uh, feedback or suggestions, what you see um, in your institution. We will we'll look at the results from, from that perspective, yes, in that context. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Julie. And again, if you're if you're new to the forum, that's obviously an example of a video question. Um, and uh, thank you, Afet, for the for the very nice um, answer. We have a couple more um, questions.
questions about the study, and then we need to look ahead to the future a bit more. Uh, this is one from Adam uh, Moxel, who says, can you better define first time transfer in? Uh, for example, are traditional age students with significant dual credit for high school considered first time in college? Here, I'll, I'll put that back up on the screen so you can see it. Um, uh, you know, so if you have significant, if you have lots of AP credit, for example, would that would would you be considered first time or transfer in? I guess is the question. This is. I'll say just a couple of things. Maybe uh, Ben, you can add to that. This is uh, this is how institutions define them. Um, Right. And I believe, uh, yes, that's their definition. I know that some institutions may consider students who 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 come with 12 credits, for example, as a first time mm -hmm. student. Others require fewer than that. So that would be really up to the institution. We have certain things. If they were currently that uh, dual enrolled students, they would not be first time. They um, this is after high school graduation. Okay. Okay, so when I, I entered college as a with enough AP credit to make me a sophomore, um, so I'd still be a first year student according to that. Uh, okay, it, it it would be up to the institution. Yeah, yes, okay. institutions. I got it. I got it. Uh, Adam, good question. Uh, thank you, and uh, I've had thank you for for this answer. Uh, Ayla has a follow up question here, um, which is how would you recommend institutions attempt to establish a benchmark of CCR for students? That's a very good, uh, very good question. Benchmark could be uh, whether it's a national average or state average. We don't have it in the report, but actually uh, PDP institutions can receive it uh, by different, uh, and they can set that benchmark or they can um, how, how that to what they want to choose to compare themselves. Is the state benchmark better for them um, or similar institutions? Um, how they want to do that. And, you know, uh, I, I want to mention that, again, uh, looking at the data in relative terms is fine. We say which group is doing better than the other, but then we should also look at it in absolute terms. If the group has, if a, sub, uh, if a group has 55% uh, credit completion ratio, uh, is it good enough? It doesn't matter whether it's better mm -hmm. than the other groups, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that's, that's the point I would make, really, to look at in absolute terms as well, and also to look at within that group, uh, what are the intersectional experiences? Again, not just uh, looking at these broad populations that, oh, women, women are doing better. No, may, there might be many other things going on within that group, actually. Excellent. Excellent. Um, well, let's, let's take this, uh, let's turn this around a bit and look ahead. Uh, and I just wanted to ask a, a quick a quick question myself, which is, if we consider this to be the class of you know 2026 or so, it's not going to be the class of 2026. Um, a bunch of them are going to take till 2027, 2028, maybe 2030 to graduate. So, I mean, based on this data, are is the news for students as well as for institutions that the uh, the four year graduation mark is not really a uh, something to expect a lot of students doing, but that's going to take a lot longer. Um, yes, but we have also heard, and I want to mention something that our suggestion is not that every student should be expected or required to take 30 credits within their first year. We understand that there might be students who choose to do that, who yeah. choose to take uh, fewer credits because uh, they have other uh, life responsibilities. They have family, they have uh, work responsibilities. So, but we do want to you know, bring attention to that, saying uh, perhaps the right recommendation could be um, the, if first year is difficult, you, um, you're hesitating, you might be hesitating how you will navigate the system, maybe fewer uh, credits, but it, to the extent possible, really um, catch up with those credits, increase those credits. Mm -hmm. And also credit completion ratio. It's not mm -hmm. signing up for 30 credits and also how students are completing. Actually getting them done. Yeah, uh, that's a good point. I'm, if if we can, just I know you you you've analyzed meticulously the recent past. I know it's hard to switch around and look at look ahead to forecast is difficult. Uh, but I'm curious. Do you think that uh, if if this pattern continues or it deepens based on COVID, 
do you think five, ten years out from now, how do you think this will change higher ed? I mean, do, for example, do you think, as you just said, if that, do you think we will see more and more students who are effectively part time, uh, or I mean, Ben, maybe do you think we'll just continue to see the enrollment decline, continue to decline as as fewer and fewer people are able to get credit in a timely fashion? So I think part of our, our my FS discussion was really acknowledging that students have agency and that we need to make sure that they are able to uh, register. There's no policies in place that potentially prevent them from hitting the CCR or car rates that we think they should be. Um, and that's really important is is that enablement of the student to be able to actually do that if they're um, if that's yeah. possible. Um, so I think that's an important thing to consider. And yes, maybe there is a, going to be a change in how we think of the typical enrollment within post-secondary education. And how do we actually understand that within the data um, and make sure that we're addressing and acknowledging potential equity gaps um, within uh, between groups uh, as well. Oh, fascinating. I'm not sure if, if, that, if there was anything you also were thinking about with that. Um, I just wanted to mention that hopefully also the metrics, uh, this early momentum metrics, what we call again leading indicators, might be really helpful uh, uh, with, to improve actually these results. Again, the focus more early on how uh, um, how the completion of course is going on, not so much. Uh, of course, completion rate, we will look at the completion rate, but also equal attention to these early momentum metrics. Uh, I, think, I think this is going to have a powerful impact on campus decision making and strategy. Um, friends, we're almost out of time, and I want to make sure everyone gets a chance to ask their questions. So this is your, your, your last chance. Oh, sorry. Um, uh, S. Eikenberry, and please forgive me if I've mangled that wonderful name, uh, asks, any thoughts about changes in student success by gender in the post-Roe versus Wade future? I, I don't think that the report could certainly speak to that. Um, I think that would potentially be a conversation, um, kind of one of those side conversations to take um, some of this data and potentially think about, um, for sure. There, And that's really the purpose of the report, is to start people asking those questions um, and start investigating what things, like I talked about, at those different levels might be changing that might not only uh, kind of be affected upwards, but also, so to speak, downwards and inwards. Um, so I think that's a great uh, question that stems potentially from the data that we have in this report, but we certainly can't speak to that or answer that question. Well, I, I appreciate your uh, your candidness and uh, S, that's a, that's a great, great question. I just shared in the chat a, a, a blog post I did on this subject, mostly drawing on the work of other people, especially the great uh, Joellen Parker. But it may be that you all finding in this report that women are ahead of men by a few points, that, that may uh, well go backwards. We had some institutional questions that came up as, uh, as well. Uh, Roxanne had a question earlier, which was, how are higher ed institutions able to opt in or join uh, future research studies along these lines? So I, I think really, um, we, we try to provide this data publicly, but yes, like Afet had talked about, there are benchmarking capabilities that are exclusive to people who actually are part of PDP or the post-secondary data partnership. Um, so that's certainly something that you can reach out to, to us uh, at the NSC to say, hey, I'm really interested in being a part of the post-secondary data partnership to be a, a part of this wealth of the data as well as to be able to use this wealth of data. Um, so um, certainly reach out to us, uh, Student Clearinghouse uh, website. There's, uh, if you search post-secondary data partnership, there's lots of information about it as well. Well, thank you, um, and and uh, I think you can see that you have some fans here who want to uh, who want to support and participate as they can. And speaking of which, uh, Rachel uh, comes back with this question: When is the next PDP Insights report coming out, and <laughs> which and which metrics do you plan to focus on? Very soon. Again, uh, we, we do need to wait a little bit for the full years of data to come in for 2020 and 2021. And as soon as we have, uh, because there is uh, there are full starters, there are spring starters within a year. Um, so hopefully within a, um, in a few months from now, we, we should be able to do that. 
Oh, good. And any of the uh, uh, metrics, you, you've talked about a couple of them and people have asked you for a few more, but do you have any more that you want to add in terms of metrics that you're hoping to get to? Um, we have a few we mentioned, yes, at the end of the report, we have gateway course completion metric that uh, yeah. we are collecting. That might be one. Um, and also this online face-to-face -face hybrid uh, courses that students take that would be an as one uh, to look at. Excellent. Excellent. Uh, in the chat, by the way, uh, Tom Hamas mentioned that the Shaping EDU project is doing an oral history project on pandemic teaching. Um, so, Tom, I would love to learn more about that. Um, and if uh, there's anyone there who wants to share it, please, uh, we'd be glad to host them because that sounds terrific. Uh, I have a very selfish question to ask both of you, which is how do we keep up with you two? Um, do, we, do we follow you on, the, on Twitter, on LinkedIn, or, or where? Uh, I'm assuming you both have at least three podcasts here um, each, right? Yes, absolutely. Social media is fine. And we have nscresearchcenter.org uh, where we post all our reports and publications. So that's another way to. And Post Secondary Data Partnership has its own site at studentcraringhouse.org. Oh, great. Great, great, great. Um, well, uh, friends, do you have any more questions that you'd like to add? Um, George, you've been going, uh, you've been uh, romping around in the chat. Do you have anything that you'd like to pose? Um, actually, I think we're almost, we're just about out of time. Um, so uh, I did want to uh, raise one, one last point, which is I think what you've described um, is going to give a lot of campus leaders uh, and individual faculty um, information that they can act on. Uh, in terms of populations they need to direct more resources to uh, and students will deserve more care. Uh, so I think this research itself should have a real salutary, uh, real great beneficial impact on higher education. Um, I suspect that was your intent and I'm really, really glad that, uh, that you could join us. Absolutely, and that's what our hope is, right? At that this, uh, these data are actionable and institutions can act on them. Very good, very good. It would have helped me too, by the way. I mentioned I started off as a sophomore. It took me five years to get my undergrad degree. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm definitely one of those problem data points for all of you. Um, well, uh, thank you both so much for coming. Thank you for all this research. We're really looking forward to following up on, uh, on the next one of these, as well as on your future work on equity and data. Thank you both so much. Thank you. Thank you for all the great questions and discussion. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Brian, for hosting. Very much appreciate it. A real pleasure. Thank you, Afet, and thank you, Ben. But don't go away yet, friends. I have to point you to uh, what we're working on and what's coming up next. And I do want to second uh, their thanks to you for your great questions. If you'd like to keep talking about this, some of these great questions, like what is the role of disability or faculty status in this kind of data, join us on Twitter. Just use the hashtag FTTE or tweet at me, Brian Alexander, or at Shindig Events, or pounce on my blog, brianalexander.org, to keep this conversation going. If you'd like to look back into our previous sessions, uh, which cover some of these topics, just go to tinyurl.com slash ftfarchive. And if you want to look ahead to our next sessions, again, we've got topics ranging from reimagining education to free speech, the climate crisis, uh, what the end of Roe versus higher ed, Roe versus Wade means for higher ed, and our community session in the fall. Just go to forum.futureofeducation.us. And if you want to share any of your own work along these lines, please just shoot me a note. I'd be glad to share it with everybody else. And in the meantime, Again, thank you all for your great questions and comments. I hope this was really useful for you. It was definitely very useful for me. Uh, good luck preparing for a fall semester. Everyone take care, be safe, and we'll see you next time online. Bye-bye.